Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Daniel Schweiger. I'm the soundtrack editor of FilmMusicMag.com, and uh, thank you for coming to the uh, Logan Q&A and uh, CD premiere event. I'd like to introduce on the uh, far left hand, uh, Mr. Marco Beltrami. Next to Marco, Buck Sanders. Hello. Marcus Trump. No relations. <laughs> <laughs> very, very sad. <laughs> and uh, Brandon Roberts. Well, I mean, I, you know, what can you say about Logan? It's really a, a superhero film and score unlike any other. Uh, very bleak, depressing, powerful, uh, and a wonderfully sad ending. Uh, big hit critics absolutely love this in the way they haven't shown love to many superhero films of late. And again, the score is such, such a powerful component of that. You know, it's really, it harkens back from everything to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest to the taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3. Uh, and just how incredibly diverse this is. And what I did is I, you know, I kind of brought some clips to preamble about how, how we got to Logan, the, the scores among the dozens uh, that you've done, Marco, that kind of show the roots of this. And uh, Zach Toe put together some pretty cool clips here I'd like to show that kind of uh, go through both the, the Western elements and some of the superhero elements that would end up in Logan. Um, and I'd like to start off with uh, three clips. Uh, our first clip was from 310 TV, and I believe that was your first film with uh, director James Mangle. And, That's correct. And an Oscar nominated score. You know, the, the score itself definitely played homage to spaghetti westerns and Morricone. It, it had a very different, very typical, very harsh angry sound uh, that, again, I really distinguish it from your, your kind of typical Western revisionist score. Uh, well, the thing that, um, the thing about uh, Morricone that I've always been a fan of is um, his uh, taking things that may appear in one context and using them in another, like, for instance, um, sounds that well, it's an extreme example. It sounds that might not even be musical in nature, and making musical things out of them. I think it's it's sort of the whole um, in um, in the '60s and '70s. There was a real push for um, pushing the limits of instruments and extended techniques and all that stuff, uh, because you know harmony had already been explored and all this stuff. And, um, these, it was trends that were happening in just music in general, and I think what Morricone did was he did this with um, instruments. And um, in this in this particular scene, um, like for instance, the, the rhythmical elements come from uh, using we had a an organ uh, like a pump organ, and using just the pedals and. Uh, using the, the rhythm of pedals as being a, a, a rhythm in it, as well as uh, jaw harp and um, even a, a, a um, chimes on a clock. So there are things that might not be normal scoring elements, like you would use, you know, they're instruments that aren't used in, in uh, a normal fashion. And I think those that idea of working with with sound is something that uh, stems back to uh, my interest in more time. Very cool. And I know a few gentlemen worked on this particular score. Uh, Not me. <laughs> <laughs> this one. This one. Yeah. Uh, well, you orchestrated on it. Yeah. Um, the uh, I, I just the main thing I remember about this one. So, we were so excited to do a Western, because this was, you know, there have been so many horror films before this, and uh, Mark and I are big uh, Western fans, so at the same time we were working on Die Hard 4, yeah. and that was a very sort of difficult uh, project, but uh, we uh, we would split up the day, like half of it would be Die Hard, then we were so excited <laughs> to jump, you know, the second half of the day would be about Yuma and just 
you know, a lot of the sounds we just made in this teeny little bungalow studio that we had. You know, it's just Mark and I, uh, you know, messing around with instruments and, uh, you know, processing them. And, uh, we were excited because, well, first of all, I think every every movie that I do is a Western. So, um, it doesn't matter what the genre is, but I approach it like that. So, to actually have a real Western to do is exciting. So, I think, you know, another thing that really, for me, distinguished Logan is this kind of emptiness and beauty of, of these very tortured characters. And again, to reach back to that, you have a very excellent film that Tommy uh, Lee Jones directed called uh, The Homesman. And a very beautiful, spare, unusual score about uh, this grizzled uh, cowboy hauling these mentally unstable women across the West. And again, uh, music that really just conveys this haunted, this beautiful landscape. And this is a, a scene that really features the score, you know, almost solely. Where you just the music is conveying so much about it. It, it, characters who really don't talk very much, and again, you really kind of push your whole idea of sound with this, but also there's a beautiful kind of hymnal, melodic quality about this that really conveys these characters. Oh, thanks. Um, same organ. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> and you actually, I believe you have like a two piano out, out like in, in Malibu where you oh, were. Yeah, yeah this, I mean, we had a lot of fun on this far. Uh, we had, yeah, like Mark just said, we recorded, um, we just fin finished building this beautiful studio. Uh, everything sounds great. And, and we decided that we record the orchestra outside um, so that the sound wouldn't have any warm surfaces to vibrate off sort of dissipate. And um, Buck created a lot of sounds. That sound you hear in the beginning um, is a guitar that he built called a harmonic guitar, um, which, well, he'd be better explaining it, but um, it, it has that, that in the beginning of the cue. I don't know if you can pick it out uh, before they go in the water. Um, and I think it's the same spirit of um, innovation and curiosity that um, spurs both these directors, both Tommy and uh, and Jim. Jim very much encouraged us in our early meetings to not worry about the picture and to just write ideas. Um, and you know, I was getting nervous because we had this movie. We had like eight weeks and you know we're spending four of them just dicking around writing things in. You know, at our first session we had a session, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it, 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 what I'm trying to say is that there um, I, I, it's that same it's that same spirit that um, characterizes I think uh, the projects that I most enjoy. And, and that is, you're not trying to copy the attempt, you're not trying to um, uh, follow any conventions really, but just you know, sort of follow your heart and what you want to do. With, it's interesting that you picked these two directors because um, I think uh, the reason Marco got Yuma was because they basically took the whole thing with uh, three burials of Milky Adis Estrada, which was Tommy's film before Homesman, and uh, and it, you know he it, it works so well. D D Mangold's really great at placing music and uh, you know putting a feel that you might not expect to put in a scene. And uh, so you know, I, I think he responded to Tommy Lee's uh, you know desire to you know explore sounds and you know sort of be free against. Uh, what a traditional approach, you know, a current day approach might be. So, uh, you know, that, that there's a strong link between those two guys when it comes to that. So, Marcus, actually, please tell me how you came into uh, Marcus out of orbit. Um, I, I started orchestrating for with, uh, on, on Hellboy, 
That was the first, um, so I don't know. How long we had a, a, there was a, an orchestrator that used to work with me a lot, starting out back with Scream. His name was Bill Boston, and um, he, he doesn't live in LA anymore, but um, he kept telling me, oh, you gotta check out um, my friend Marcus, who they went to school together. Um, did you go to school with him? Yeah, cool. Oh, all right. Um, actually, no. Uh, we worked on a on Halloween eight together. Danny <laughs> Lux. <laughs> that was uh, yeah, that was a scary sort of movie. And but yeah, he he mentioned you a lot and said you know um, we should meet him. Um, and yeah. I think yeah that uh, it was after it was after Terminator I think. He but, yeah, right after Terminator. Terminator. I think yeah. that's when I finally met. And then I first I had him orchestrate a few things and um, it was everyone was really. Um, the guy that I normally use, his name is Pete Anthony, up until that time, you know, he was very protective of his own gig. He couldn't help but comment on how much he liked Marcus's work. And then, so, you know, soon thereafter, I realized his talents, and just instead of having more sure, I just had him write the scores. I, I think the first thing that I wrote on was, was, uh, um, was the cursed. Um, I remember that, that was the first thing, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was like a West Craven. Right. It Underworld. went through the mill. Underworld was after that? It was after that, yeah. And then we actually co scored a movie, a French movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, Messerine. Yeah. 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 Great yeah. movie. Yeah. How about you, Brendan? So I'm Marcus too. <laughs> 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 so once Marcus got too busy, um, uh, then, I don't know, right about the time Marco started s scoring this TV show called V, like the remake of, of V. I love the remake of V. Um, <laughs> what happened? Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, where it ends is it makes it the most depressing oh show in God. history. Yeah. It ends with the destruction of the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no resolution. Yeah. Um, but uh, basically, um, uh, Marcus, Marcus jumped on it for a little bit, then Marcus got promoted, then, then Marcus left a vacancy, and Marcus and I actually went to school together. We've been yeah. friends forever. So he said, "I know this guy. He doesn't. He, he you know, he can help out at least with TV because I was working with um, on Battlestar Galactic and stuff before that. So he kind of, kind of, I just kind of took his spot, and then it all, it all kind of worked out. So I've been on since, since then, basically. And I think the first thing, first film I did with you guys was Scream Four. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. before Woman in Black. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and so this I think is basically so. our our stable. It's like every project, you know, it's the, the four of us, some semblance of the four of us, you know, whoever's doing other things, whatever. But uh, it's um, we're like a family. Yeah. Very cool family. We don't <laughs> use his last name though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if you want to get a table in the Midwest somewhere. <laughs> It's very sad. Yeah. Um, so now we get into the Marvel Universe, and uh, I believe the Wolverine is actually your first Marvel score. Um, and it's a very, very uh, same character, very different film, uh, same, same character, same dir director, very different film, and fairly different score uh, from what Logan is going to end up being. But again, uh, this is a great example of you know, hard-ass superhero scoring. of that scene is not only playing the, this tension and this race against time, but it's also really playing the emotion of her trying to save her friend. And again, it shows the kind of the difference between more of a kind of dissonant experimental scoring and then going to maybe more typical superhero scoring in the second half of that sequence. Yeah, it's actually a, a scene that, that Brandon worked on, and um, the uh, I remember I, I mean I can tell from my point of view what was going on and then Brandon can speak a little bit about it too but um, the um, I remember exactly those things that you're talking about were a difficult thing to achieve we there was and um, we had a similar situation on a movie that we had done just previous to this called World War Z where there's it, these zombies taking over an airplane and there's a sustained tension we had to do it um, and so we were working, Buck had created these shepherd tones, which were like uh, rising tones that keep 
going. They, you know, um, they sort of loop around and there's no beginning or end to them. And um, that was sort of the starting point, but uh, I think, right? For, yeah. And then, but then, yeah, I mean, what, what are you talking about? Um, it's a really long scene, right? So um, the idea was to divide it into two major chunks. And um, and actually, I remember when Marcus first met Buck, he said Buck only talks about shepherd tones, and, <laughs> and that's just this, one of the, that's just a, a slowly like Marcus said, it's just like a slowly rising sound, and um, and then I met Buck and he's just like oh you know shepherd tones, so um, so I was like all right let's check this out. So we tried it on World War Z on a couple of things, but then on this it was like surely you can't get through three minutes of footage with one long sound. I mean, obviously there's stuff underneath it, but you can't. So um, we tried we tried that, and then totally coincidentally, Mangle, uh, the director was really into, was it Ligeti at the time? Yes. He got really into like dissonant, um, dissonant orchestral sounds. So we tried, tried that concept with orchestral sounds, and that gets you through to the point where she gets whacked in the face and or I, when she loses her sword. And then the second half of the cue is basically when, um, like you, you mentioned, when it gets into the more traditional action stuff. But even that is still based on a slowly rising shepherd tone, but we just changed the, the arrangement of it. So now it's so, but it's all rising. So um, it was kind of, and then we had no idea what he'd say. Like, no idea. Because he... It's the type of thing that some, some cues are easy to demo their melody and Harmony and uh, it's easy to show the idea. Some things are a little bit harder, and until you actually hear it, it's really hard to get the full effect of it. So, but but he really dug it. Yeah, he dug it. He dug it. He dug that one, and then <laughs> <laughs> and then there was other ones. <laughs> but um, no, that was a. It was. It's also I think you know going back to what Marco was saying about James Mangold is he he has um, uh, he has musical courage. He has no problem looking at that and thinking, a, you know, five minute long scene. There's, it's one vibe. Whereas a lot of directors, I think, are like, oh, what about hit that, hit that, and that person falls, and blah blah. blah. He doesn't. He wants you to, at least most of the time, he wants it to feel like one continuous vibe you're in. So like you're you're ta you were talking about um, the emotions of it. Yeah, there's the the ticking clock aspect where like it's a race against time, and then there's also this. Um, uh, this hint, especially at the beginning of like him digging into himself and stuff, um, and then there's like that whole score was like what a teaspoon of Japanese uh, <laughs> stuff. We were only allowed to use a little bit, but um, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a cool cool scene to do. So. Yeah, no. and again, you know, the, the second film set in Japan, and again, it's fairly conventional stuff. But now we get into Logan. Um, and you, you originally uh, you weren't the first guys on it, but then you were given the given the score, and I guess with not respectively a lot of time to do it. Um, and again, a very completely atypical superhero movie and superhero score. What was it like getting something just so radically different from you know the last film? And just I, I mean, I I was really excited. I. Um really had no idea that this was even something brewing or I mean I'd spoken to Jim after Wolverine and he mentioned that you know his concept for um, for Logan was he was going a different direction that he the thing that really inspired him when he was writing it was this movie Drive and um, that's sort of the vibe he wanted and I was like yeah you know that, that sounds cool but, Pursue that, and I was way actually recording a score in Russia. I got back, and right as soon as the plane landed, when you, you know you turn on your phone, and I get a call. You got to come over to Fox, and um, uh, I, I went over to the screened movie. This is just before Thanksgiving, and um, uh, I was blown away. I mean, it's really, it's really good. I mean, it's basically the movie that it, that exists now, very minor changes were made to it, and um, uh, I thought there was a lot of room for, even though it was a very textural and minimal score in many ways, there was a lot of room for exploration. Uh, I spoke to Jim afterwards, he said the thing that 
he really wanted was a throwback to um, some of the scores of like the 70s that weren't maybe so polished. Um, you know, he that um, he said everything that bothers him now about scores and scoring is that that everything is really smooth and mixed well, and he misses that rough around the edges quality, the, the rawness, and he said, I'd, I'd love it if you just try working on some ideas, um, not to make sure like I was saying before, and see what you come up with. And he gave me references. He said, I really like, um, he named a few movies that were inspiring to him. Um, but yeah, The Gauntlet and uh, Taxi Driver and uh, and Paper Moon, which doesn't have a score. But the um, the like Taxi Driver, for instance, like if you put that score against Logan, it wouldn't it wouldn't really work. It would you know because it would it would fight a little bit. But there is an intensity about it um, that was inspiring to me and to I think all of us when we got started on this, and that was where we took off from. We had this scoring session um, at the village with just, I think, six or seven players, and just wrote some ideas. I was nervous because it was really kind of wacky what we were doing, and I, you know, a few people from Fox decided to show up, and then very soon thereafter, Walked out. And, and, um, <laughs> first day, first day actually, but what, what, you were, I think you were at the board. They walk in, and one of the one of the uh, one of the music execs turns the other way and says, "And and the directors heard this." <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, and he's like, "All right." Yeah. So they walk out. I really thought this could very well be our last day. <laughs> but um, you know, we had a great music editor too. It's a guy Ted Kaplan who. Um, would um, take our ideas and cut them in different places, even things that we were like, ah, what are they? this is, you know, you know, it's just an idea, we're throwing it out there, but then he would cut it against picture, and it had a, a really, there was something about it that really worked, you know? Um, I think one of the first things was something that uh, Marcus did uh, called um, Local Logan, which is like, I mean, it's really kind of off the wall. Um, again, probably insp inspired by these same ideas. It's almost jazz-like intensity of uh, um, taxi driver type thing. And um, after we were like, well, that, that's fun. We had fun, but you know, what, what, what's going to happen with this? But the editor actually cut it in over a fight scene, and Jim saw it. He's like, this is this, it's great. It really works. So, um, and he also kept the studio at bay. Like, we didn't have any, normally, I mean, I've done other um, superhero movies, I've done other studio movies where you're playing back cues and you have a room full of executives. And what happens always ends up happening is it becomes the least common denominator. Whoever has the, whatever, does, someone doesn't have a problem. If there's 11 people, someone always has a problem with something. So you're left with nothing. Uh, that people like. But here we, we were saved from that process. It was just me and Jim and Buck and Ted, and we would go in and play stuff and, uh, on a weekly basis and, uh, and go from there. So uh, the score had a chance to be a little bit. You know, especially here, you know, some rumors about how controlling Marvel is of their, their whole musical sound. And this is certainly, you know, you know, I really dig their scores. This to me is certainly the most unique. Marvel superhero score. We didn't, I didn't, I've never met anybody from Marvel. So. <laughs> I don't know. I, I imagine that's true. Well, it's like technically Fox. I mean, it's Marvel material, but it's, it's Fox. It's Fox. Fox uh, oh, it's about it. well, I don't so we actually have something very cool for you guys. Uh, no video, no photography, but um, thanks to uh, Fox, we have uh, some footage from Logan uh, that shows the musical development of the score. And uh, Buck, I have this is totally fresh to me. I haven't seen any of this.
prove my point. But the um, <laughs> but, but, but what I'm trying to say is that um, in reference to your question, that um, we all come up with ideas and uh, and we work closely together. You know, it's um, it's not the first time, and we sort of understand what, what we each do and what our strengths and weaknesses are so forth. So. You know, one thing that hit me when I saw the film is it's almost kind of like in two parts. You have the, the kind of the Western, the, the lone gunslinger first half, and then you have essentially the, the kind of Mad Max Thunderdome second half, uh, second half where he becomes a savior. And there's kind of a, a different energy uh, to the score in the film. Uh, Brenda, why don't you talk about that? Uh, I had actually much more to do with the, the first part. Um, so, uh, and then the, the second part, I was out of my league. So, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, um, I think Margo's right. We, we kind of spitballed a bit to see what he liked and everything. And then, um, and then based on what, what stuck, you know, like we had tried to incorporate everything. So the, um, the chunk, a lot of the stuff I did was more towards like the, the smelting plant s sequence. Um, so, I think Mark has kind of Mark has kind of set the gauntlet in terms of like um, how crazy we could go. And normally Marco does that actually. Yeah, like normally Marco does something like, "Surely we're going to get fired," <laughs> and, and, wow. then, and then um, and then they then they love it. And then in this case, I think Marcus uh, took heroin or something. But either way, <laughs> either way, the end result was 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 like like Marco said, he, he really wanted to go that far with it. So. The life of jazz aspect of it. Um, so we kind of did some, some wacky stuff with that, wacky stuff with the orchestra, and then, um, and then. And that's one instance where the studio actually said, I don't know, it's gonna push a little too far. So Brandon had to do this one particular cue, uh, a couple of different ways. One, which was a much tamer version, uh, but smartly, um, we recorded both of them. And after hearing both, you know, the director's like, I'm going to fight for this one, which he did. And that's yeah. what ended up in the movie. So. Yeah. Marcus, how was the gauntlet thrown? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, um, as Mark, Marco mentioned before, we had a, a session in, in December at the village where we had like a very, you know, like, almost like a jazz ensemble. And um, I think the point was for you to s sort of, you know, instead of doing mock ups for the director, you give the director really responds to like the rawness of the of live instruments, right? You wanted to sort of sell the ideas that the yeah. main the main title ideas right right so and then um we had one that the turnum thing which was just like this sort of i don't know uh, i don't know, say throwaway idea but it was just like a very short idea that's just like repeating ostinato um for laura right for laura right it ended up being laura's theme or or their relationship theme with him uh, and, and laura or that's what jim sort of wanted to to use it for and so, you know, we had the, we had a session with, you know, jazz musicians, and then I thought, okay, we'll just do a, a version for that, for, for that ensemble of that theme. And because we had time, I thought, you know, there's n another thing that we haven't really tackled yet, and that's sort of the berserker rage that he goes into, yeah. right? And I don't know, it was just like this really, really dumb idea to, that I wanted to try, and it just he just happened to respond to it really positively. <laughs> it was really like I'm, I, I think I remember like before we recorded, I said to Mark, "Okay, so look, uh, this could go either way. I mean, maybe you can say like after the first time, you know, just just you know, we'll move on to something else." <laughs> but it just happened to be really cool. The, um, and I, work with it afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Like, That's because it was a little bit uncontrolled. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 um, but and Buck worked with the stuff and yeah. uh, really found a place, you know, sort of dialed it in and yeah, um, like no no instrument sounded the way it usually sounds. Like the trombone, I think it just made this weird kind of thing for it. it just sounds very sort of 
yeah, I mean, it's 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 sort of this one-off kind of thing that turned into the you know that's something that kind of at least from a from a um, basic sound approach sort of uh, hit what he was trying to do, what Jim was trying to do. But, in Buck, obviously, you go back with Marco. You both got nominated for an Oscar for the Hurt Locker. Um, for you, what was the most challenging part of the score? Uh, uh, Logan. Oh yeah. Um, uh, I, I, it was. I mean, it, it was challenging in the sense that you know Jim's very demanding and uh, in a great way. You know, he's got a very musical ear. But I mean, I, I loved it. The, it's it's hard to. It's hard to look back on it as a challenge. I mean, it was a time crunch, and you know, if we had an extra month, you know, who knows, you know, what, what else we could have dug up. But uh, I, it's—I'd say time was the was, was the you know the, the time crunch was the biggest challenge. But creatively, it was, we had a blast. We really, you know, I loved it. So. I mean, for me, another cool thing about the score in the film is that. You know, I mean, for me, another cool thing about the score in the film is that, you know, you've got Laura uh, and you've got evil clone Wolverine, and you kind of hope that evil clone Wolverine is going to have this little moment where he, some humanity comes up, but it never does, <laughs> ever. How, how, but yet, you've got Laura, who humanity does come out, but who is like this kind of feral animal child, just, just slicing and dicing from left to right through a good chunk of this film without a, quite a lot of sympathy. But how do you want to link these two characters up, musically? Laura and Laura and, 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 and uh, Evil Evil Wolverine. Um, I don't. No, I mean, uh, I don't think we ever thought about linking them. You know, it's uh, it, you we, know, we've been done a month. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, it, it, Jim really wanted to sell you know the, the actors' performances, and uh, you know, I mean, there are some pretty over the top. Moments musically, you know, but uh, overall, I think the score is pretty subdued, especially compared to the previous Wolverine. You know? um, so I, I don't think it was uh, his main focus was really on Logan and Laura. That's really what he spoke about, and that the sort of paper moon father daughter relationship. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is interesting. Like we never thought about how could Laura uh, affect. 24, you know. Yeah, but it's a good point, though. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is a relationship musically between Logan and 24, I mean, based on the same theme, really, the same motive. It's not really a theme. That's the score isn't very thematic, it's more motivic, I would say. You know, uh, like, um, like a few note type of thing rather than development in the traditional sense. Uh, and so they're related, but you know, Laura and 24. But I, mean, I guess technically, twenty four is her son. If if she's Logan's daughter, so oh, yeah. yeah, we should do more family stuff. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but to the family, it's, it's actually very cool, you know, that you're all here. Because increasingly, you know, on, on studio tentpole films, they're, they're, you know, composers with a team of people writing quite a bit of stuff that the composer does. <coughs> um, and, they, and some composers just take credit for that. And the, a, a lot of other people who work on the score uh, don't get credit. And this is not the case here. Obviously, you're all here, and it's, it's awesome to have you guys here. But this is very, together. very rare. Yeah, yeah it is rare. I yeah. mean, you know, what do you just, you know, what, what do you three gentlemen think of that? You know, just in terms of how people in your position never get credit, but you're, you're all getting credit. For uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, I've been, I've kind of seen a few different versions of it all, right? You know, I've been done additional music in a few different scenarios, and. Um, Pencil and paper, which it's you know I, I think I was like the last the last guy to, to switch from hand orchestrating to finale or whatever it was, right? So I, I really I, I I kind of felt and and I've, I love the darkness of the darkness of the music that we get to do, right? So I don't know. And then yeah, and then obviously personally, I mean, you know, 
This guy's all right. He's all right. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. I mean, I, as I said before, it's like a family. You know, we uh, it's uh, when when we're doing uh, um, when we're at sessions, it's always like a blast. You know, uh, we're shooting the yeah. shit with like all the directors, and I mean, it's it's like a you know, I don't know. It's it's you know what I think. Like when I started out really early on, was, um, when I first came, I, I went to some sessions. Now I don't like the name names, but um, and I. It was like so. There was so much stress on the sessions, and I'm thinking, this is horrible. You know, this is really this job. It, it's it's hard enough because you spend so much time in a dark room by yourself. You know, just looking at a picture and all that. Uh, so um, the idea is, you know, how can it be more fun? Well, it's more fun when there's more people involved and you have. You're working together, and it's more of a collaboration. I mean, film scoring, as by its nature, is a collaboration. You're working with the director, you're working with other people that are giving input. Um, and to me, to extend that is um, makes the makes the job that much more enjoyable. And and when there when, when there is pain, which there often is. <laughs> <laughs> spread, spread it around. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have a lot to land on your shoulders. You know? Well, I'd love to turn this over to any questions uh, that you all might have. Any? Yes, sir. What I should be doing, you know? So, and then I'll, I might get off on a, on a tangent. Um, uh, and sometimes it takes you down a, a good path. I remember when I was working on um, some of the guys of Egypt, there was a composer I was very, I, I thought would be really good for. I, I listened to a lot. I even referenced to these guys to check out and all, but you know, it, it was a little too out there, I think. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of um, stealing other people's ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the next question. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, just how do you start when you get a project? It's like a totally blank slate. You know? Like, how do you how's your thought process on approaching like a big project like Logan or Wolverine? Anything? I call it Marcus. So you're really <laughs> panic. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's. Uh, you're, you're right. Look, every picture is sort of like a puzzle that has to be solved, and um, it can take a long time to, to crack the puzzle to come up with the elements that are basically the essence of the film and the score. And it takes some trial and error, and um, I, I don't know what the process is exactly. Um, sometimes when you work hard at things, nothing happens, and then sometimes when you're taking a crap, it all comes to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess this is sort of the same question, but um, you know, um, someone was really impressed by the, the, the simple and yet yeah, deep timbres that you all bring to these scores. I mean, you have four quarter notes, and in Logan, you could be on 1M2. I, on 1M1 version 2, it's played on a prepared piano, I think. And then in um, Pretend to Yuma, you've got four quarter notes played on the pedals of the harmonium or whatever, right? And it's like, how do you get, I mean, how do you ultimately get to that sound? I mean, does it just happen that you have a harmonium and a prepared piano lying around, or do you do you imagine it and find it, or is it, uh, can you t unpack that at yeah, all? Yeah, a lot of that. Bucks always searching for ideas. The way we recorded the score was very important. The things that we recorded were important. Right? And then, yeah. I mean, I think that's what he says there wasn't enough time to work on the score is because he was constantly developing uh, the sound of it. Like, for instance, we had, instead of using regular percussion for this, we used drum kits because we thought it would give a certain intensity, but we couldn't just use just really drum kits because then it would sound, it would sort of take us out of the movie realm. So I you know, spent a lot of time making it sound, processing the drums so that it sounded unique. Yeah, I mean, you know, if it's a director like Jim, who's got a very strong idea, you know, we, we 
usually come in so late in the process of a film. A good director will really have a strong idea of the feeling that they want, and so it really helps. I mean, when we start really early on a project, I think it's a, it's a lot more sort of, uh, you know, just really throwing stuff against the wall in uh, a greater sense. Uh, but it's, it, it really, uh, it, that really helps. And, and usually they'll tell you what they like about the temp, you know, if there is a temp. And, um, so there's usually some good guidance. Okay. You know, it's, it's not completely a blank universe. So, so just talk about the temp for a little bit. Like, how does that affect your process if you go in if there's a lot of it? Do you have to back out of that? Or what's the negotiation of working with temp music because everybody's throwing stuff in and it's destroying them? I'm just kind of curious how that process works. Um, we usually listen to it when we first see the movie and turn it off uh, because it, you want to have your own take on it and um, the thing that Temp rarely is able to do is carry a uh, emotional arc throughout the picture. It can work good for this scene or that scene, but it doesn't take you on the whole journey of the picture. So um, once in a while, if we can't figure something out or whatever, we say, well, what they do in the time here? How did that hit? How they solve that problem? Whatever. But for the most part, I prefer, I, I think these guys too, to um, sort of you know watch the picture once with it, see the effect, and then get rid of it. So uh, my understanding of Kim's point is that there's. It underlines what the image is, not the soundtrack. But there was one particular scene, I think that is the cute lim limonator or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the moment, it really struck me. Like, it, I, I, my attention went to that heavy piano, you know? The, in the movie, while we were watching the movie? While I was watching, but I thought that it was so cool because from that moment onwards, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm watching something different, you know? I mean, a different trip than the yeah. usual. So, how was that decision of that putting that s strong cue there? You know? Well, uh, Granny can talk about that, but again, this was something that we talked about when early on as a conceptual thing, and then this is the cue actually where we had to record two versions of it. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the piano because uh, I think I've become convinced that life is like a it's super messy. And like you, you, you see the end result, right? And you think, um, you think maybe that we all sat around and said, you know what it needs. <laughs> okay, so at the recording of that, everyone liked the music except they said, like all the executives, and, and we got to get rid of that piano. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that that's ridiculous. <laughs> so we, so Marcos and Buck are like, well, let's record this thing anyway, right? So we get so, so we we record the guy playing this ridiculous piano thing we probably spent what like like an hour and a half making the piano sound a certain way all and as we're doing it all we're thinking is they're just going to mute it they're just going <laughs> to cut it out so then marks and i go to see the movie together and we have no idea what the end result's going to be right so we're sitting there and all of a sudden i just hear the single loudest piano <laughs> in my life. i can barely hear there's like like 65 other musicians I, they must be this low and all you hear is a guy going like that yeah. like, so, So you never know the end result. So, so in answer to your question, the piano was always in there. Uh, to be honest, it was supposed to be a little softer. Than it was. <laughs> so, but in the end, um, Super he, he, in the end, yeah. the exact opposite of what we thought would happen happened, which is everything else came down in volume, and someone said, "You know what this thing needs? <laughs> piano." And, and that's what happened. So, so there's no. And a lot happens at that at that final dub when they're finally you know like putting everything together. A lot of changes happen at the last minute, and that was one of them that that was very unexpected. Um, so it was originally intended, but just not at that volume level. But hey, you know. There's also the um, we did an alternate take where uh, Randy Kerber was 
a pianist and uh, we had him do it on a B3 organ. And, uh, it, it sounds like somebody being taking a pelum. I mean, it's, it's the it's funkiest. It's not like, I, it was I, the funkiest thing I've ever heard. It was yeah. like, we had him do it twice. And it, 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 it was so much fun to sit there and listen to it. I should have brought that. That whole, <laughs> that whole, <laughs> that whole uh, limo scene, that whole skate, he basically had a B3 and he was just grooving through the whole thing and it, it turned it into like. It turned it into like 1970s Spider-Man, or like, like, like the old, it, it would have been the coolest to see ever. Like, that, that didn't make it. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, let me get that scene now. Okay. <laughs> another question? I have another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Right. Um, this is more of a broader scope, so it's, it's okay if no one really has an answer to it. But as far as like current film music trends, are there trends you find yourself fighting against, or trends that you're actually happy to see in the current performing climate? I, I, I never want to hear another drum in a film score. <laughs> that's, that's right. I, I, I'm so over the, the big overproduced drum thing. Um, but you know, it, it's it's hard to fight it. You know, when they ask for it. Uh, Certain things become vogue, and you hear them in all the temp. All of a sudden, everybody's using the same pieces, and the, um, and you know, so. It gets it can it can get a little annoying, but we it, it's we try not to pay that much attention to to that. Yeah, we're always looking for you know what's going to be most what's what's going to make us excited to to work on something. So we'll you know explore you know recording outside or you know using unusual elements and trying to get the ball rolling with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I have a question. What, the, what does the producer do? The, the film score producer. I'm, I'm familiar with what the composer does and the orchestrator. Yeah, what do you do? Well, yeah, what does the producer do? Because, you know, I've been with the market 20 years now, so it's like, it's sort of hard to define what it is I do. Sometimes I write a lot, sometimes I just work on sound, sometimes I'm uh, really focused on the recording aspect of it. So, I. You know, the sounds being recorded. Yeah, like I, I'll do like pre-production of you know working with synths or whatever the sources are. Uh, so I, I treat it more like the idea what a, a record producer does, like where they'll sort of have a, uh, a, a vision for how we can approach the, the music, you know, and the, the score. So it, I've seen the credit elsewhere, but I have no idea if that's if they are approaching.